Okay, we, part of this talk is about myths of Market Garden. Here it is, Market Garden. Right. But the first myth is that you can't uncover the lies. That you, one of the things they say to you is that our oh, people will never know. Actually, that's a lie. If you dig hard enough and if you speak to the right people who have the direct knowledge of something, you will know. And you can find out the truth, and I'll be talking about that later as part of this presentation. Uh, also, this whole thing of exploding the myths, because the myths become bigger than the reality. The myths are all to do with, for example, liberation, as we're seeing all around the city, in Arnhem, Neumann, and around this whole area, this whole thing about liberation. Of course, the battle was not actually a liberation. It was a failure. And it meant a, a particularly bad situation for the local residents, although they've been very generous in being friendly, uh, in being friendly to the British who made their lives so difficult by making such a mess of things. Also, the other myth is that, that this was just another battle. It wasn't just another battle. It was an incredibly important battle at a very important stage during World War II. And that's why I think there's this continuing interest in it, because there have been attempts to massage history of this battle. The twisting of history is quite Orwellian. So I'm going to basically run through these questions. But we'll start with my introduction to this is the basics of the battle. So here we go, we're going to make it to on, if we possibly can. And this is key, this little thing about the river, because if they'd succeeded in taking Arnhem, this would have been absolute chaos to the Nazi supply lines around this area. And they would have had to bring loads of uh, other divisions from other parts, maybe from the Eastern Front as well, to stop this behind their lines. It would have been a very chaotic situation if they managed to make it to Arnhem, which they very nearly did. This was my introduction when I was age 15 to the battle which was playing this game for two months every Saturday afternoon. Uh, four of us, young 15 year olds from school, grammar school in, uh, in um, South London. This is what we did as kids, we had to fight this battle. I was the British, my friend was the Nazis, and I lost. <laughs> but that was my introduction, I didn't think much more of it <clears throat> after playing that battle. Now yeah, that's a bit, another picture of the same game. It's an American game. It's slightly biased because it makes it difficult for you not to do what the Allies did, like drop too far away from Arnhem. And it's quite a big game too, as you can see, it stretches right out. And we, we, we stuck it with blue tack to the wall. We were playing it on the wall over several weeks. And I was never quite sure if my friend, whose bedroom it was in, was moving some of the counters during the week. And we came back next Saturday, I thought, did I really need that? Thing? But anyways, let's get into the questions, because Journalism should be about asking questions. Nowadays, there's very little questioning, I think, in, in the journalism I see. These two handsome guys were both dead by the end of the war. I think von Richter was. Mogul shot himself. But these were the guys that knew how much the Germans knew. Mogul was in the Tafelberg, and von Richter was in charge of this part of the Western Front. <clears throat> this is another, you know, aspect to all of this. This I found this in a, in one of those uh, commando books, I think they call them, that you get as uh, we we used to get as children um, in our teenage years. I, lo I love I love these books. We used to enjoy reading them as teenagers, and you know, and uh, in primary school. Look, sir, over by the woods. Holy mackerel! Tanks and Huns by the score. <clears throat> We've walked smack into a trap. So this was the Arnhem story. And these were the guys that were preparing the defence of this area. <coughs> and this was their opposition. So, the question is, how much did they know? Well, there's all sorts of evidence about that. But, one of the most recent, uh, I will share with you now. I mean, okay, so maybe we should talk about the two main reasons they knew. One is King Kong. This, uh, this um, I'm not sure how, if we're going to have him first. No, he should, maybe he should be in a minute. Uh, one of the main reasons that these guys knew was has been revealed recently through Ultra. Now, people know about Bletchley Park and the Ultra decryption service. That was how they did it. Simple as that. Two weeks before the battle, it's now known that the they were, British were reading the German radio traffic and they knew 
the Germans were discussing, are they coming on, the, on their own radios? So I think I've got a transcript of that. Okay, here we go. Friday, the 15th of September. This is, was in the hands of the planners of Market Garden, a place called Moor Park in uh, northwest London. And the actual message had been deciphered on the 9th of September. Allies in German reports, that's what they call it, because they had a whole section, every time the Allies were mentioned, the people at Bletchley Park would put those decryptions into a certain section. Addressed to unspecified on the evening of Thursday, 9th of September. 30 British Corps, that's the 2nd British Army, between Antwerp and Hassel, bringing up further corps possible. So this is the Germans talking about what the British are up to, and the British listening in. 11 to 14 divisions with 8 to 900 tanks, photo reconnaissance tasks, indicate probable intention is to thrust mainly from the Wilhelmina Canal on both sides, Eindhoven into Arnhem. Further specification of area incomplete, but in, this is in brackets, sorry. So I'll, I'll just leave that bit out. To cut off and surround German forces Western Netherlands. Now, so that was known by the British on the 9th of September. The Germans knew quite a great deal about what was going on. And why it's, it's, it's very unlikely that it was a coincidence that they had the resting, uh, resting um, Second SS Panzer Corps just outside Arnhem, in the woods, with a little bit of uh, grass coming from their mouth. Relaxing. So these guys knew a lot more than uh, most of the historians will admit to. And these guys had, had uh, let the can out of the bag. Okay, so <coughs> this is question number two. Who gave permission for a former SS officer to help plan Market Garden? And of course, I'm sure you all know who that is here on the right. Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands making it very clear to history that he was looking over the shoulders of Montgomery and Horrocks. So Montgomery was the overall commander. Horrocks was 30 Corps general. And by the way, he was, he was very sick, apparently, during the battle. Now I wonder whether he was sick in the head or sick in the body, because he knew that he wasn't actually doing his job. And I will say one thing now about Horrocks, is that I was told by one of the publishers, he said, oh, Horrocks, he left this letter to be opened after he died, about the battle. And he left it with uh, a military publisher called Leo Cooper, who's the husband of Jilly Cooper, the famous novelist. Now... When Horrocks died, various people went to Leo and said, where's the letter from Horrocks? We want to know what really happened at Market Garden. And Leo Cooper was a very disorganised publisher. He had piles of paper everywhere. And he says, oh, I think it's in this pile. Oh, no, no, no. He lost it, basically. Lost the letter. So it would be very interesting to read that. But it was significant that Horrocks here felt it was necessary to leave something to explain what had happened after he died. He didn't want to face up to it, face the cameras or whatever, uh, while he was still alive. So let's get to the end of this question. Who gave permission for Bernhard to be, uh, Prince Bernhard to be uh, in on the planning? Remember the picture from, late, from earlier on. This is the guy that signed Bernhard's security pass. And I don't know if anyone recognises him, do they? Can I ask any question? Ian yeah. Fleming. Ian yeah. Fleming. This is, uh, Ian Fleming was in Naval Intelligence in the Second World War, the famous Bond writer, and here he is. Interestingly though, he, he, was, I mean, he was told by the King to sign the certificate. He was told by Churchill, Bernhard is trustworthy, we can have him in the team. But you know what, he wouldn't sign the pass for the Royal Navy. So Bernhard was never trusted by the Royal Navy, he couldn't go into any naval establishments, and if he was to go onto a ship, he would have to seek the captain's permission. He had no special rights in the Royal Navy. And I'll tell you why that was. It's because Ian Fleming didn't trust him. Now, Ian Fleming's wages in the war were being paid by the admirals, right? Not by Downing Street. And not by, uh, not by the king, most importantly. So... Fleming wouldn't allow 
Bernhard anywhere near the Navy. And there he is. That's a more, more recent picture, the sort of Bond years. So, uh, who gave permission? That's the question we're on at the moment still. And here they go. So they're off to... Uh, I'm not sure how much they knew about where they were going. They probably were told that they were going to Arlem, Nijmegen or whatever. And certainly the senior officers were, but they're... Some of these guys were lambs to the slaughter because the people at the top didn't want this battle to succeed, and we'll talk a bit more about that. First of all, they've been betrayed by Bernhard right from the start. And, I, you know, there is clear evidence that Bernhard was involved with this guy, King Kong, but there is other evidence too. And there they go. These are the little um, airfields near where I live, around here, and up a bit further up the country, and off they went in the Dakotas and their gliders. Uh, off over to you guys in the Netherlands here. To uh, 101st Airborne to Eindhoven, 82nd Airborne to around Nijmegen, and the poor old 1st Airborne up in Arnhem. Some more of the little thing of where the routes were and all the different, different uh, uh, airfields they took off from. Mostly transport uh, command. And down they come! into, uh, well, some of them came into uh, uh, a battle that they were expecting, others not. So, <laughs> there is the amazing Colonel Pinto, the Dutch officer in the British Army, Barry's little, this is his take I on King Kong. I had lunch with a man called Colonel Pinto. There was a very popular BBC programme called Spy Catcher. And he was a Dutchman, and he worked for the British. He told me this story, that he and his team were the people that went behind the British Army in Holland, and what they did was to get hold of all the people when they, the officials and everything else, put them into camps to then sort them out and find out whether there were any Nazis or people of, you know, risky character. He had a number two who had a photographic memory. He could say to him, Sansa, Sansa, what we know about him. And he'd be able to almost recite it off straight away. Very good number two. Anyway, the story is this, this man told me. They were going through the people that they were capturing at that time. And he, that night, went out for dinner. When he came back, it was sort of, I don't know, late in the night, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock like that, and he went up towards the gates for his camp, where all these people were in prison temporarily, to check them all out before they were released. And the English sentry, who had just an ordinary rifle, was standing outside there, having been harassed and having a hell of an argument and the thing, with a great tall man, big man, with two girls on his arms. And when the sentry saw Colonel Pinto coming, he said, Sir, sir. So Pinto was, walked across, a very experienced man, you see, and looked at this big chap standing there, you see. And, What's going on here? He said, Sir, he said, this man's trying to take two of these girls from inside the camp out. I'm not allowed to let them go. And he said, and this chap stood with Schmeiser on one thing, Lugum automatics on another, Grenades and God knows what, you see. So Pinter looked at him and said, What's your name? And he said, King Kong. King Kong. He was boasting, of course, you see. But what his real name was, Lindemann Christians. This man was a bully and very big. Pinter was not, you see. And he noticed that he had a captain's pips on his arm, on his sleeve. And when this man was threatening the colonel... Oh, you mean for a British army, Captain? Yes, yes, you see. But yes, so the Dutchman, King Kong, had got his pips here on the sleeve, which of course you can't have. And so when he was trying to browbeat the colonel, he went forward and grabbed the, the things and pulled them off him and said, how dare you have your pips on your sleeve? And when he did that, the man shrunk because he was found out, you see, and he went off, and the two girls were put back in again. Next morning, Pinto went into his office. This is first hand, I can tell you. Went into his office and said to this number two, what do we know about King Kong? Oh, he said, it's a famous Rezo. Rezo, that is a defense 
a partisan gang, as it were, a réseau in France. And who was in this réseau? It was run by a man called um, hmm, Lindemann's Christians. He said, well, we'll do immediate checks on this man. And they started doing checks for several hours on, on his background. What they found out, that this réseau was betrayed and every man in it was killed, with one exception, Lindemann Christians. So he said, let's look at it. We must immediately go and get a arrest warrant, and we'll go to his camp and arrest this man. We've got to look into him. So they got the warrant, went across to the Dutch headquarters there, you see, and went in, and spoke to the duty officer, whatever it is, we've got a warrant here for a man called Lindemann's Christians. We want to interrogate him. Oh, I said, so you can't interrogate him. He's uh, the head of the King Kong Rezo. He's one of the top patriots in, in our country. He said, nevertheless, we wish to interrogate him. And they said, no, you will have to have a much more higher arrest warrant than this. And it will have to be with a counter stamp of the Netherlands. You've got a British one. You're in Holland now and you will need this. So he said, right, we'll get it. So they left. Right. And it took them a day to get it. Following morning, he went back, Colonel Pinto, with his number two, with a properly filled in warrant for the arrest. And when they went in, they said, well, it's terribly sorry, it's late, he's, um, he's gone on a mission. The mission was to tell the Germans of, of the uh, British invasion of Army, Operation Market Garden. He betrayed them. Lindemann's Christian, but he was the one that let the Germans know and they had their reserve units there, as you know, they knew 24 hours beforehand what was going to happen. And that's his testimony, he's somebody who met Pinto and got to know him. Uh, so this is where, uh, I think it's, can someone tell me what this, how you pronounce this, the Dutch, it's a prison where Lindemann's so-called committed suicide. After the war, Schwerin or something? Schwerin, Hotel. What? Hotel. The hotel? No. It's a nickname. It's a So, what's that in English? Prison. Prison Hotel. Yeah. Schwerin and Prison, nicknamed the Orange Hotel. Ah, the Orange Hotel, okay. So, that's where he so called committed suicide, but of course, there are still questions about whether he was murdered or not. Um, obviously, there was a massive cover-up took place after um, that whole business because it's just it's just quite clear that the all of the records disappeared. Um, this is one of the I mean, there are a few I just did a list on my, my presentation here about all the different reasons why we know that this uh, was a cover-up. Okay, so. Dutch intelligence were warned that Lindemans must not be trusted, but he's assigned a top secret mission. Okay? Very strange. On the same day Pinto's informal investigation begins, Lindemans is transferred from the Dutch camp in Wutuk. So, the same day the investigation begins, he suddenly disappears. Uh, despite further evidence Pinto presents to them, British counterintelligence prevent him arresting Lindemans. They use the words, it is absurd and in doubtful taste. Hmm. Detailed plans for Market Garden, because this is the myth about the glider, are very unlikely to have accompanied any troops, precisely because they might be found in a crashed glider. Stories conflict also about the location of the crashed glider, which was, a, I think, a cover story. I'm speculating here, but it seems pretty likely. For the Lindemans and from the Bletchley Park, Decrypts. Some, some sources say it was Vucht near Eindhoven where this glider crashed. Others say it was Grosby, but it can't have been both. They're 40 miles apart. So maybe a cover story. Also, after his outburst, the senior officers at Dutch intelligence headquarters, and despite his rank of colonel, old Pinto had all of his staff removed all of his translators and his transport when this happened. So the guy is just completely stripped of all his ability to do his job at the time of Operation Market Guard. 
Um, following up the incident, uh, the Arnhem incident, in December 1944, Pinto was taken seriously ill with a mystery illness, returned to England, and took him several months to recover. That was, he was taken ill in December. While Pinto's ill, as I said, all records, there ever had been a King Kong investigation, including all the files of his interrogations in Britain, uh, disappeared. They all disappeared from Shafe headquarters. Did the trial of Lindemans, Christians, Christian Lindemans, where are we going uh, was delayed indefinitely. And in 1950, under pressure from the Hague, Pinto was prevented from publishing the King Kong story in the British national paper, the Sunday Dispatch. Then, and I've got a copy of it over there, in 1969, a fabricated version of the story was, was published called The Lindemans Affair. Uh, written by someone called Anne Lawrence, which admits that Linda Manns was a spy, but it, she says that he was not unable to, he was unable to tell the advert anything. So, which doesn't really make any sense at all to me. Right. And so he became a successful author after he got the Spy Catcher book published in 1952, a fascinating account of all the interrogations that were going on in London, right the way through the Second World War, of suspicious characters that arrived on the shore or in aircraft or were picked up by the police. If they thought there was any suspicion they might be a spy, it was Pinto's job to discover whether they were or not. Okay, another important question, number four. We're getting through these. I'm going to go a bit quicker, maybe. Yeah. So this is the big, big question. It's <coughs> who cut the wires? There's the explosives. But actually, this is one of the easiest questions to answer, although for historians they seem to have found it impossible. If you look at the historical record, it's quite obvious who cut the wires. And this, yeah, this, so this is the British afterwards. Uh, there's quite a lot of explosives here, yeah, and these mines as well. Here's the guy that did it. Uh, at least him, not him personally, he's Captain Moffat Burries, I Company from, uh, I think it's, yeah, 504th Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. He was one of the one of my heroes of Arnold because he did everything he could to win the battle, and he took his own initiative as well. Here's a quote from his book *Strike and Hold*, and there he is. This is a more modern version of Moffat Burroughs. Uh, At sundown, he says, we found ourselves under the shadow of the massive Nijmegen Bridge, which rose nearly 20 stories above us. This is just after they crossed the uh, Nijmegen, the Vaal at Nijmegen, and. Against all odds, the ex-second airborne had got to the other side of the bridge. I mean, it's an amazing piece. One of the, one of the most so-called so most heroic things of the Second World War, taking that Nijmegen bridge. He said he lost half his company. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we might have some audio. Anyway, he says the dike road ran under the north end of the bridge, which was supported by huge concrete columns. An eerie silence had fallen at the north end, and we didn't see any enemy troops. Could it be the Germans posted no defence at this end of the bridge, which would be a bit peculiar? Across the river, the city of Nijmegen was ablaze, and there was a great deal of fighting, firing around the bridge's north, sorry, south end. As I stood beneath the north end, I saw a set of concrete steps that went from the lower road to the main highway at that end. Well, those concrete steps have gone now. There's been a massive uh, reorganisation down there, rebuilding of it. I told Sergeant Leo Murray to take some men and cut any wires they saw around the supporting columns. This is, this is his own initiative, he's done this. We didn't want the Germans to blow up the bridge because we needed it to be intact when the British tanks crossed the river. So what I say is, could that eerie silence that he encountered at the north end of Nijmegen Bridge be because the Germans knew the whole thing was about to blow up and they didn't want to be hanging around? And what Harmel, what Harmel says, he was the uh, he was the Nazi commander who was interviewed by uh, Colonel uh, Kershaw in his book It Never Snows in September. He says, "Enemy tanks on the bridge. As soon as I saw them, only one course of action remained." As he later recalled, "I now give the gave the order on my own responsibility to blow the road bridge over which further tanks continued to advance. It failed to go up." And he says, this is the German General Harmel, probably because the initiation cable had been cut by artillery fire. Now, 
if, if you take what, uh, what Burris is saying, he's saying, when my men got to the top, we, we, we cut the wires and the tanks started coming, right? So that is just before Harmel says, he saw the tanks coming, now it's time to blow the bridge up. And there's, uh, that's uh, what that account I've just read from you by Moffat Burris is. So it's pretty clear that Moffat Burris was, and his men, what is it, uh, particularly the guys who uh, he calls Leo Murray, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to cut those wires just before the tanks came. So there's a lot more tanks coming now, because, and in fact someone's waving you down here, hi guys, uh, and lots of them are starting to come across Nymagen Bridge. A whole row of them. So this is the bunker where Harmel was looking, uh, and he, this I guess, where he, yeah, where he gave the orders to blow the demolition charges at the time. So that was Moffat Burris did it, and I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, what his, and his men, the 82nd Airborne, who just crossed. Even more tanks coming now, look. All across the Nymagen Bridge now. How far is it? Now, the key thing in the battle, from a military point of view, was that all of the uh, German defences were preparing to blow the bridge. So, they were saying, as soon as we see tanks, we're going to blow the bridge up. That meant that all of their forces had been sent into Nijmegen to defend inside Nijmegen. So, when these tanks started to come over here, there was very little in the way of defence. So, there we are with those guys again. So, the next question, and the biggest question, I think, probably, of the whole <coughs> battle, is this one. Uh, this is from Moffat Burris's book, there's, there's Carrington there. And this is in a, a, a commemoration of the battle in 1994. Carrington died just a, well, a few months ago, weeks ago. Uh, and I tried to interview him, he, wouldn't, he would not reply to any of my contacts to interview him. Uh, so there he is, doing his little thing, in a tank. But he was the guy that didn't go anywhere. Okay? So he came across the bridge in Nijmegen and they just ground to a halt. What's the matter with you guys? Those are British troops at Arnhem. They're hurt bad. You're not going to stop. Not now. I'm sorry. We have our orders. We busted our asses getting here. Half my men are killed. And you're just going to stop and drink tea? Look, we're now facing a completely different situation. We can't leave with tanks up that road. Jerry will pick us off like sitting ducks. Our infantry are still fighting in Nijmegen. When they get here, we'll move on. For Christ's sake, must you do everything by the book? Our orders are to wait for the infantry. I'm sorry, but there it is. Another thing to point out is these tanks sitting around. They're a perfect target for the uh, German anti-tank guns, and they're a perfect target for the uh, Sturmgeschutz tank destroyers. You do not, if you're facing any kind of armoured uh, resistance, the last thing you do in a Sherman tank is sit around. Mm -hmm. You don't, because you've got to keep moving. The, the uh, anti-tank guns, they can't traverse, the, well, it's difficult for them to, and the Sturmgeschutz is the same. It's, if you want to turn a Sturmgeschutz, the tank destroyer, You've got to use the tracks. You've got to start up the engine, and you've got to turn the thing like this. So it's got a bit of traverse. So it was idiotic to stop. Absolutely idiotic, just from a military point of view. And lots of excuses have come out over the years why people think that is the case. Right. Uh, so this is the question, isn't it? And. Is this? Oh, I think this is, yes, this is General Browning here. So this is when uh, 30 Corps come, comes up to Nijmegen. They start to have uh, conversations. Gavin, I think that is there. Uh, they're having conversations about uh, what are we going to do now? So they've got across the Nijmegen Bridge, but they've decided to stop. Now, there's every excuse is used. We've run out of ammunition. We've run out of uh, petrol. Um, it's getting dark, actually. That's a big advantage if it's dark because it's very difficult for the Germans to get a range on you and shoot at you. Okay, so, you know, you, it's not so easy to find the road, and also you might have to have a light on your tank, which the anti-tank gun can 
focus on. But it, it, it could be seen as a real advantage to move forward in the dark. We now know it's about 20 minutes for a Sherman tank to get up that road. This is Horrocks here, who was in charge at the time, and Monty. And these are the little boats they'd use to get across. This is a bit out of order, this, but you know, it's important to have those. So anyway, this, this is my, my uh, attempt to solve the conundrum of why those tanks stopped there. Is this place in Brussels, the Hotel Maison Rouge. The previous month, I think it was the 20th of August, there was a very important meeting here of all the Nazi industrialists. They were sent there by Hitler's treasurer and the head of the Nazi party, Martin Bormann. And in the hotel, the Red House Hotel, and the Red House meeting, all the plans had been agreed for after the war. Because these industrialists were not interested in losing their industries and their wealth. Mm -hmm. They had made big plans to make sure that that was secreted around the world, mainly in Switzerland, Argentina, places like this. And that gave them a lot of bargaining chips with the Allies. They didn't want to be killed in a bunker in Berlin. Of course they weren't going to. And many of those industrialists had already many subsidiary companies in the foreign countries. So they were just moving all the wealth from bank accounts into other countries. But they were doing deals. And they had a lot, a lot of um, uh, chips to do those deals with. One of the most important ones, of course, is the loot of the whole of Europe. Right, so they've got, they've been going through the bank vaults all over Europe, taking all the money. They've been going through people's houses, picking up uh, any kind of loot, wealth. There's bearer bonds, which were a major currency, which is a kind of share certificate, which is like money. So say I've got, uh, I don't know, £100,000 worth of shares in Shell. I can give you that certificate, and that's £100,000 cash, basically. So the bearer bonds were an important part of the wealth the Nazis had. So they were. This was the final signing off on the agreement across Nazi Germany to uh, to to for, the, for them to survive the war. Well, and it's not just me saying this. Here's the American intelligence report all about it. Plans of the German industrialists to engage in underground activity after Germany's defeat, the flow of capital to neutral countries. So these deals began in August 1944. Market Garden, unfortunately, was a bit more than a month after that, so those deals were already being done. Uh, this is a imp very important book when you're understanding what happened uh, on the island between, um, between Nijmegen and Arnhem. Uh, in the snows in September, which is Kershaw, Robert Kershaw's um, book, where he interviews the Nazi leaders. Very important, I think. I mean, and also he's a very nice guy. Kershaw. Uh, he was a British Army colonel who was serving in the British Army on the Rhine and the German soldiers would come up to him and poke him and say, hey you missed, you missed the trick at Arnhem, you know, you British. Because they'd heard through their own armed forces the truth of the battle which was that there was nothing between Nijmegen and Arnhem capable of stopping those tanks. And that was and he has the hard evidence of this, okay? This is Harmel, uh, he was put in charge of the defence of Nijmegen, because the Battle of Arnhem really isn't the Battle of Arnhem. That's another thing to say, it was the Battle of Nijmegen. That was where the, the decisive part of the battle took place, and <coughs> the Germans knew it. That's why his, the main general on the ground at the time was concentrating on Nijmegen. He was going to stop them getting over that Nijmegen bridge. And it's also why he was ready to blow that Nijmegen bridge up. By Tom. And Robert Kershaw says that when he interviewed him in the 1980s, before he died, Harmel was puffing on a big cigar. Oh, you made a big mistake. And hopefully I've got a little quote from Harmel here. Yeah. The four panzers, he says, who crossed the bridge made a mistake when they stayed in Lent. If they carried on their advance, it would have been all over for us. So that's from the horse's mouth from the general himself, who was in charge of the German defences. And Kershaw says in his book, it's quite possible the Allies, I'm not sure if some of this is harm or some of this is Kershaw, it's quite possible the Allies might have been able to feed a battle group into Arnhem before the road was finally blocked again. 
during the first night of the 20th and 21st of September, there were only security pickets reinforced by one or two outposts in position. The situation continued until Knaust finally arrived in force on the afternoon of the 21st. For five hours between 1900 and <coughs> midnight, the road was totally clear. And we also know now that it was probably until the next day, because uh, well, I was chatting to the people in Ireland, they said that the John Frost is people only finally surrendered at 11 a.m. the next day. So that's about 18 hours you've got to get those, because the Frost being at the bridge, you could stop the, the, the German armour coming across down this direction. So for five hours, he says, anyway, between 1900 and midnight on the 20th, the road was clear. Nothing of substance could close it until canals arrived. Frost's forces were overwhelmed just as the window of opportunity closed. How interesting. So they decided to start going at the wrong time. So there you go. There's, this was why the Germans couldn't get down to Nijmegen across the Iron Bridge, because it was littered with all this... Uh, mess of uh, that Frost had made of the reconnaissance battalion. Um, all these <coughs> were just in the way and the Germans couldn't get their tanks through there and also of course you've got by the side of the Arnhem Bridge here you've got the British firing their anti-tank things at them and they've got anti -tank, at least one anti-tank gun as well. So it was completely impossible for them to get down to Nijmegen. They had to use the Panadon ferry uh, which was almost impossible. Well you couldn't get the tanks on the ferry. You could get, apparently you could get the tank destroyers, but you couldn't get the, the, the tanks on the ferry, so that is a very dark picture, sorry about that, but that's in, that's in the book and it shows the evidence, there's Arnhem, and there's Nijmegen, and here is the road, and this is the artillery map from the Germans that shows where the defences were, so there's a few down here in Lent, there's the road, nothing until one here, and one here in Elst, and there's the rest of the road going up to Arnhem, there's virtually nothing there. And Sergeant Robinson, in his uh, Grenadier Guards tank, had managed to get through all these, he got to there. So that's why there's it's such a controversy about the lack of movement. So there's your tank, Sherman Firefly, and uh, what, how fast did they go? Pretty fast, 22 miles an hour. And uh, so these are the guys that should have been rumbling, but weren't. There's his quote from the old song, um, Brigade Führer Hall. And Carrington again. So, another picture of the Burries. So, this is what the Americans proposed. They said, OK, well, jump on your tanks and we'll go. But no, 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 Carrington was having none of that. And here is Carrington uh, in the 1980s when he was. Uh, the uh, Defence Secretary and then Foreign Secretary he was Defence Secretary for Edward Heath, Foreign Secretary for Margaret Thatcher, and then of course he went on to NATO, become Secretary General of NATO, and in the 1990s, for I think it was five, six years, the Chairman of the Bilderberg Group. So he is also from the hotel. But he didn't go to that hotel, but he became the Bilderberg Chairman. So here's the guy who was sitting in his tank and wouldn't go anywhere. And the American Moffat Burris, the hero of the of the Vile Crossing, pointed his gun against his head and said, go. Now, he denies that that ever took place, but he wouldn't be interviewed. And here's another picture of Carrington. I don't know what, where I found this, but it's quite weird, isn't it? This is the green man, and here's a pair of scissors. What's he up to there? This is a storm shirt, so that's one of these. See, that, that there's got, that this gun can't go from side to side. So this is what was waiting. Now let's get on to the Hexen Castle. Here it is, and this is where we are now, isn't it? Down here somewhere. Uh, so the Witch's Cauldron, which is also very near here, which is where that Bilderberg, those Bilderberg meetings started too. Uh, these two, there's a bit of a, I don't know if you can sense the body language there, but here is the Polish general Sosabowski who was so messed about so appallingly by General Browning. Um, and the, uh, the result was that basically Browning ordered, first of all, Browning was one of the major villains of this because he just kept messing about and he wasn't taking the battle seriously. First of all, one of the most important things is as the officer in charge of this operation on the ground, 
he didn't even come to Arnhem. He went to Nijmegen, to Grosbeek. He decided, I'm going to land in Grosbeek. How, what did he know about what was going to happen in Arnhem? Why didn't he, as a general in charge of this battle, why didn't he go to Arnhem? He decided, I'm going to go to Grosbeek Heights. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're getting there. What does an extra five months of World War II mean today? Okay, go back to the, the Red House meeting. Because here was a, a meeting which was really about international organised crime. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all this Nazi loot and we're going to use it and secrete it round to these nice businesses. If you go back to the previous slide about uh, Borman, his plan, in fact this is what he did, is he created 750 corporations and into those corporations after the war he got all the SS people and he said take off your SS uniform, put on a nice suit, we're going to make you on the board of directors of this company. And the money was laundered through Sullivan and Cromwell mostly, was laundered through Sullivan and Cromwell, the Dulles Brothers law firm in New York, and put into those businesses. So this was their <coughs> secret international organised crime network of big, big business. And they had massive amounts of money to uh, draw on in order to let those businesses grow after the war. The other thing that Borman was very clever in doing, and he talks about in that Paul Mayne book, is, was to put Jews on the boards of directors, sometimes as chairman, because nobody would suspect that a organised crime, Nazi-funded business would be fronted by a Jewish person. But let's face it, there is, I, I think there is Jewish organised crime as well as other sorts of organised crime. So that was one of his aims, was to make sure that nobody recognised that those businesses were anything to do with the Nazi loot. Uh, this is a guy, a guy, he actually phoned me up a few weeks ago, Idris Francis is his name, but this is his uncle, whoops, Idris Evans, preparing for the, uh, that's, that's him, that's his wife, 1946 Nuremberg Tribunals, and, honestly, and this is the proof that he was there, right, and now we've got more proof as well, he's not making this up. Uh, a German general declared to his face, yes, you have beaten us for the second time, this is at Nuremberg. And this guy was one of, he was <coughs> escorting the prisoners at Nuremberg. Yes, you have beaten us for the second time, but next time we will win. Next time it will all take place so slowly you won't know what's happening until it's all over. So what he's suggesting there is that a kind of Fourth Reich is being created, which is a financial empire. It's not tanks anymore, it's banks. Real, okay, we're getting towards the end now. Sorry, now. Uh, real heroes and villains, well here for me is number one really, he is Moffat Burroughs. His book is fantastic, he as a person when I interviewed him is absolutely adamant about I knew that those tanks had to go to Arnhem and if they didn't go I was prepared to kill one of those damn British uh, tank drivers because I'm a paratrooper too, I know what it was like. He says they were hanging on by their fingernails. And maybe we can have that bit, bit, bit board here. I think he says something along those lines. With Moffat Burroughs. His voice, for me, it's almost uh, epic. I thought they were going to blow the bridge up at any moment, and I imagine this is so did he. Voice, okay. so, um, and I was absolutely astonished when we got over the bridge. We just swarmed over the tank and this started hugging the guys. I remember. The guy's head that was sticking out of the turret, I just hugged him around the neck and I said, you guys are the greatest sight I've seen in, in years. And I kissed the tank and told him to head on to Arnhem. And I said, why are you stopping? Why, why, are you, why are you not going to Arnhem? He said, well, I can't go up there. That gun will knock out my tank. And I said, well, we'll go with you and get that gun. And uh, he said, no, I can't go without orders. The road from the bridge was on a sort of an embankment and I think it would have been quite difficult to go ahead. I think it would have been difficult anyway, even in the daylight, because you were sitting dark for everybody was there. But I thought at night, when we just sort of stormed the bridge, so to speak, it would have been very difficult to push through in the, in the dark. I just sacrificed half of my company to uh, capture that bridge. and. Um, in the face of dozens of guns, and uh, they were stopping because of one gun, and they had a whole corps of tanks. 
Okay, so that's uh, the exchange really, a discussion going on between Boris and Carrington, both who were there. Carrington just didn't, simply denies it. And there is old Moffat Boris again. What an amazing old fellow he was. Well, it's just amazing, you know, chatting with him. There he is. I mean, I, I'm not sure if he's still alive actually, because I interviewed him about four years ago, five years ago. He was getting on a bit then. Tony Hibbert, another hero of the bridge at Arnhem. There is him. I managed to interview him just before he died about three or four years ago. Uh, he, yeah, he was really adamant that um, Sosabowski should be exonerated. That's another hero. This is uh, Major Brian Urquhart, who was the intelligence officer. The day before the operation Browning sacked him, he was saying, you can't send those 1st Airborne Division into Arnhem because of all the tanks hanging around. They won't be able to survive. So he was sacked for giving the correct advice. His life. He went on to become Deputy Secretary General to the UN after the war. And this is another hero, he's the guy that trained the commandos that got Martin Borman out, but then he died for his trouble. Harold Golden. And this is another hero, he's uh, the guy that went blasting his way through Lent in his tank uh, and got all the way through the German defences. Uh, this is Sergeant Robinson from the Grenadier Guards. He was, he was from the first troop of four tanks that came across the Nijmegen Bridge, a very brave guy. So he got to the stage, I was saying earlier, he got to the stage where, wow, he just got over the bridge, so he was full of it. And he went blasting away and got through all the German defences with his tank, up to the rail, rail bridge at the end of Lent, from which there was no more. Anyway, these, this is those two guys. <coughs> Remember, this is, we're going from the heroes to the villains now. Here's one of the villains, and here's one of the heroes. Sosabowski, the Polish. To try to do everything he could to help, but was stopped by Browning by making any kind of excuse, and then by dropping him into the wrong place, really, and also right on top of what he knew were German positions, or very close to German positions, so a lot of Polish was shot on the way down. Uh, Bernhard, super traitor, sending in King Kong, that sort of thing, with his, with his uh, nose in the Allied High Command well before the battle. There he is. And there's a, there's a as well, we've got Browning, we can get a spiffing chat, but absolutely useless, vain. There he is after the war with his wife, it's Daphne du Maurier, the uh, writer. After the war, Browning became an alcoholic, but he dealt with it in a very different way to Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming was also an alcoholic after the war, and Fleming was advised, said, look, you've got to get it down with your system. In a way, it's what I'm doing here today with you folks. Get it out of your system, write about it, talk about it. And Fleming did. He wrote it in his novels. Whereas there was no way that Browning could deal with, you know, personally with the absolutely appalling way that he'd led so many to their slaughter here in Arden Garden. Um, and he was given a job as the in charge of the well first of all, first of all, straight away after the battle, he was sent off to the Far East as far as they could get him away from anywhere. Uh, to work for uh, Mount Batten in the Far East Command, away from Britain. But then he became, after the war, the controller for the, uh, the uh, Duke of Edinburgh's, Prince Philip's money. He was in charge of the money for Prince Philip after the war. There's Morton, another villain, super villain, really, uh, as someone who's prepared to take the money from Borman and conduct this operation in order to steal all the loot from the Second World War to then use for organised crime. So he was a, really a super villain. I mean, there's something a bit Crowley-esque about this guy, you know, Alistair Crowley, anyone that knows about him. Just, he, he, to him, he was one of those people to who it was all just a game. 